Welcome to First Baptist Church, Piney Grove. This is Black History at Piney Grove. I'm Pastor Tillman, excited to have a chose to come in and share with us on this moment. We have today with us one of our deacons, longtime deacon servant, uh, Deacon Jerry Coverting, and I want him to share with us some of his um, number one tenure, how long you've been here, um, uh, and what capacity have you served, uh, and give us some history of your up, um, upbringing and experiences and would have kept you committed to being a servant in the church in all these years to continue to hold that staff and keep working. Yes, thank you, Pastor. I appreciate uh, you know calling me and uh, having me come in and, yes, sir. and speak to you uh, like this. Thank uh, you for having coming. never done this before, but uh, we I'm got glad. it. We got it. We're just going to talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, uh, I'm Jerry Covington, uh, deacon here at First Baptist Church, Piney Grove. Uh, I was born in North Carolina. Goldsboro, North Carolina, but raised in the state of Connecticut, in New Haven, Connecticut. You said Greensboro? Goldsboro. Goldsboro, yes. okay. Yes. And uh, but I was raised in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, the home of Yale University, th you know, things like that. Um, my father and my mother uh, raised me well, I, f I feel. Uh, I was born in 1942, so I've been around for a while. Yes, sir. And... Uh, with coming up, I had a very good life, even though I had uh, six sisters. You was the only brother? I was the only boy. Oh, wow. Yes. But uh, <laughs> I, I had some good friends. I had some friends I, I will never forget. Uh, the neighborhood that I was raised in initially uh, was a true neighborhood. Uh, it was uh, one where uh, everybody's mother was everybody's mother. And uh, everybody's aunt, aunt was everybody's aunt. Yeah. And uh, no matter what happened, uh, there was someone there to take care of you, to direct you or redirect you, uh, those types of things. And uh, I was raised in an environment that was uh, very loving. That's what I liked. And of course, uh, another thing that's important to me to know about and to remember, uh, I'm what is called a PK. I am a preacher's kid. Uh, wow. My father was a minister. He was a pastor of the church. And my mother also was a minister. Wow. And uh, uh, we all uh, were... In the 40s? In, in the 40s. A woman preacher? A woman preacher. What you say? Well, I was you raised, got it both ways, man. I was, that's right. I was, I was raised <laughs> Pentecostal. All right. And uh, okay. uh, I uh, felt that uh, at one point in time, there was nothing but yeah. that. And... Um, uh, my father uh, was a person that, at the time, back in the 40s, there were not many ministers, if any, that were on salary with uh, a church. Yeah. And uh, so he worked a couple of jobs. He was always working. But he would always be there in the morning when we left to go to school. And he would be there not too long after we got home yeah. from school. We always had... Uh, the capability of sitting down for dinner together. And uh, of course, one thing that, in my, that happened in my house at all times was prayer. Uh, he would always pray for us and my mother as well. And uh, so we kept that, that was on, always on the for forefront of my mind and, and my heart. A strong prayer life. Yes, yes. Yes, sir. And um, the, I, I went to school in a non-segregated area of the country. The New Haven, Connecticut was uh, uh, very integrated as far as its schools were concerned. Uh, I was never prohibited from going into or a restaurant or any wow. uh, type of theater or anything such as that. And uh, uh, a lot of my friends were uh, white and uh, there were a number of them were Jewish. Uh, uh, some of them were, you know, Puerto Rican or Hispanic. Mm -hmm. The uh, high school I went to was uh, a great place to go, and uh, I got a great education there. One of the things that my parents always wanted for us to do was to learn, to get our lessons. Uh, we all they they, were, they always wanted to see the homework, 
that we were you know, responsible for doing or completing. And uh, there was none of this, uh, the dog ate my homework type <laughs> stuff. They didn't want to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> they, will, they, they would never hear that, right? They knew better, right, right. right. So uh, yes, uh, there was a, a, a lot of discipline in my house. And uh, I uh, grew up to also appreciate that. I graduated high school in 1960. And approximately three days after graduation, I, I went off to the United States Air Force. Air Force? Yes. And so what shaped that idea to go into the service fresh out of high school? Well, the, the, I, the one thing that I wanted to do was to uh, uh, go to college. Okay. And uh, I wanted to major in chemistry. But for whatever reason, I was not accepted to the schools that I wanted to uh, go to or matriculate through. And uh, I was talking to a, <clears throat> a gentleman one day who was, actually he was in the U.S. Army. And uh, he was telling me about the capabilities and how things were changing in the military. In 1960, if you were African American, or back then we called, you, called, you, know, you were called black uh, or Negro, the only jobs that were available in the military, I would say only jobs, but most of the jobs available were stewards, cooks, things like that. I did not want to have uh, a part of any of that. Uh, that was not my forte. I was uh, always technically inclined. Uh, in fact, one of the things that I uh, got a uh, spanking for was on Christmas Day. Uh, must have been about maybe seven, eight years old. My sisters received dolls that had a cry in them. <laughs> and I had to figure out how this doll was crying. Yeah, so you turn yourself into a surgeon, huh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, uh, I did find out how they, that baby doll and You found cried. something else out about yeah, that. <laughs> I found something else out about that as well. But uh, those are the kind of things that I did. And also, uh, my mother bought me a, uh, uh, a chemistry set okay. early on. And I was always interested in what water was, uh, how, what was the content of milk. Yeah. Those are the kind of things that interested me. And uh, uh, how steel was made. You know, I knew that steel was not, it did not come out of the ground. It was, came out of the ground as iron, but it had to be converted to become steel. Yeah. So those are the kind of things that interested me. So anyway, this uh, gentleman told me that uh, the time had evolved and that now African Americans were able to go into many other fields within the military and uh, medical field, technical mm -hmm. fields, things like that. Right. So I decided to go down to the recruiting office, talk to them, and they gave me a test they, 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 put, they put a test in front of me and uh, I completed it. Uh, they, they, did, they were wondering how did I complete it so fast? Well, to me, it was simple test. And uh, I scored very high on the test because I had a good background in mathematics and this, this uh, chemistry and right things here. like that. <laughs> <laughs> so he must have cheated. <laughs> right. That's, they wondered, they that's wondered right. about that's that. Right. And uh, anyway, uh, I scored very high and I found out that I would be, or could be accepted into the electronic or technical fields. And uh, that's the kind of the thing I wanted to do. And it interested me. So uh, I did, uh, after discussion with my father, because I was 17, I could not just go into the Air Force. You had to be 18, a minimum of 18, and or be signed up to do so. And uh, because uh, I did, uh, I, I went to school early and I graduated early. So I did go into the United States Air Force three days after graduation. Wow. And I stayed in the United States Air Force from 1960 until 1980. 20 years. 20 years, yes. You've seen a lot. Yes, I did. I, I enjoyed my career. I truly did. Um, one of the things that I, was, uh, I found out early also was that you not only had to be good at what you did, in order to obtain promotions, but you had to be a manager as well. And when I signed up for management schools within the military, and uh, such as uh, business tra type trainings. And um, 
I found out exactly what you needed to do to progress in the military. And without uh, licking boots, uh, I, should, I guess I should say. Clean way to say yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, clean way to say <laughs> it. And uh, uh, also, I also wanted, I knew, I found out and knew from a child that I had to respect people. Yes, sir. Especially those that outranked me or my elders. Okay. Right. And so it was a lot of yes, sir, and yes, ma'am involved in that. But I was used to that. That's the way I was raised. Okay. The United States Air Force gave me a fantastic career. They allowed me to progress, matriculate through a number of different fields, uh, all in the electronic field. And uh, I was also, I've always been an avid reader. And uh, I trained myself in the latter years of, the, uh, of my Air Force career to non understand and know how computers work. I said, well, I, you know, I, I heard about computers and I needed to know something about it. In the early 60s, uh, we had mainframes that were, I would say, as large as uh, probably one third the size of this sanctuary area. Wow. Uh, it was called a mainframe. And uh, they used back then, they're called vacuum tubes. And uh, so I was weaned on uh, the early form of computers uh, through that. And I was able to, to uh, cross train or get into the computer field within the United States Air Force. So your whole career was all electronics, computers? All electronics, uh, started out in communication. Okay. And I was uh, also uh, able to cross train into what is called the airborne command post field. The airborne command post is a highly technical uh, area where the, there were a certain group of aircraft within the, the Air Force that had to be in place for all the leaders, the generals, the presidents, and it, it, his, uh, uh, his staff. And wherever the president went, you, the airborne command post has to be. Okay. Uh, for instance, t today you probably heard that uh, the, the President Miami. Biden was yeah. uh, uh, in Palm Beach and Miami. Mm -hmm. He flew in on Air Force One. Well, the type of aircraft I was trained on and worked on was that group, that group of aircraft that's similar to Air Force One. Gotcha. I even worked on Air Force One, the old version of Air Force One, okay. not the 747 type, yeah. okay, the older ones. And, uh, but I worked with that elite, elite group. I've been to a number of different countries. Uh, pro, uh, it had to be that we had to be there in order to set up communications for the president so that he would have whatever he wanted to, uh, to communicate on, uh, whether it was satellite, whether it was ground lines, whether it was radio, different types of radios. Yeah. by the way, and uh, digital format, they, he had to have that available when he got there. Yeah. So we were always there to precede him, okay. and we set that type of thing up. So the Airborne Command Post was my lead into the computer field, actually. Okay, so over those 20 years of service, mm -hmm. um, coming in in um, late 50s, 60s, mm -hmm. right, Aaron, because you, you're hearing that the change is coming about going into I guess that time and period for you to entertain going in 1960. Right. Did you experience any segregation in actual service in those early years? Yes, I did. Racism? Racism. Okay. Um, when, I, when I went to basic training, which was in San Antonio, Texas, uh, I was met with a, the, the, for the first time in my life, uh, I was called the N-word. Right, and now you, um, you're a grown man. You yes. Know, right. And yeah. it, it, this is something that did not appeal to me. Yeah. And uh, so I had a few words with the person who said that and uh, found out that this is the way it is. Culture at least, it's, at least in San Antonio, Texas. Yeah. All right. So I said, I can live with this. I, I was taught uh, at an early age also how to deal with things. Some things you accept and some things you just let it go. Right. Okay. And um, anyway, uh, that was the first instance. 
And then we traveled from San Antonio to a Air Force base in Mississippi. Well, wait, in Mississippi. So, so in, in San Antonio, Texas, that particular slur came from who? That particular slur came from a supposedly bunk mate. Okay. Okay. In other words, we lived in a barracks. Gotcha. There were, there were, uh, it's 70, one of your peers. 75 of us okay. living in the barracks okay. in basic training. Gotcha. Because this is where you learn to be, uh, uh, how to march, yeah. how to understand the brogue. Uh, yeah. You know. So it just ended with words or, or did it go beyond that? It ended right there because okay. I let it be known that I didn't appreciate gotcha. that. All right. Yeah. All right. So now you're going to Mississippi. Yes. I'm going, okay. to, going to Mississippi. And the problem I had with that was, I said, out of the frying pan into the fire. Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, I found out in Kiesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi, there were mean people that did not like me because of the color of my skin. And uh, I was able to, actually, I told myself, first of all, I did not have to leave the base in order to make it through my career uh, of training at Kiesler Air Force Base. That's where I learned electronics, fundamentals, things like that. And also communications, a higher level communication. <clears throat> I was able to get through Biloxi, Mississippi with a lot of patience. How long was that, that stint there? It was uh, 10, 12 months. Oh. 12 months, yes. And you stayed on the base the whole time? No, uh, most of the time. I, yeah. I did you know, believe yeah. the base at times because I had a good friend with that uh, I went into the Air Force with. And he was, uh, he, his background, he, well, he, his parents were Italian. Okay. And uh, in fact, one of the few people I know of that uh, was my age that spoke Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Most most kids, is, you know, they if they were raised in a family with that spoke another language, they uh, did not necessarily speak that language. They would spoke English. Yeah. Okay, but anyway, uh, Tony and I we went down to uh, uh, what's called the USO, United Services Organization. It was a place in the, in places where the military happened to be that is there to serve the military individuals to give you uh, a, a means to call home. Uh, you can get a cup of Kool-Aid, um, even a Coca-Cola, uh, popcorn, play cards, play chess, checkers, things like that. And it was a very nice social place. And, uh, but they had a white USO and a black USO in downtown Biloxi, Mississippi. And uh, that was the first time I saw uh, bathrooms where they said colored only or white only, yeah. that type of thing. And uh, I chose not to test that, uh, against that. Yes, sir. But I was then, I, I then graduated from communications training and was stationed in Warner Robins, Georgia. And that was another one. <laughs> I uh, was not quite used to uh, that type of environment. And all this throughout the 60s? This is in 1960 to 61. Okay. Okay. And, uh, uh, but when I got to that base, this was my first what's called permanent station. Okay. okay. And uh, uh, because of the way I matriculated through the training I was given a promotion. That promotion, uh, I had two stripes on my arm. That promotion put me in charge of some things. Now, I was going to ask you mm -hmm. how that transition happened between being ranked, because as you stated prior to that, your understanding was that it wasn't common for blacks to be officers. It was not common. Everybody was always serving. So it changed, so now you actually part of the change because you're there mm -hmm. and you got stripes on. Right. And so this 61, 62? Yes. So you, you made your footing pretty early and real quick. Early on, yes. And so what is the response? Well, the response was, really? Right, so it, it was okay in theory, but when they saw it. But when they saw it, yes, they didn't want to believe it. Yeah. And uh, I, had gone through su su uh, sufficient training and significant training to make them, make them understand that, yes, it is real. <laughs> Here am I. <laughs> yes. 
And uh, so, and, and, and that's the way I maintained myself. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, at that time, of, I was ever in second class, but that's what I was. Were you the first in that particular role? No, I was not the first in that role. First black to uh, get stripes. The first one that I knew of. That's what I'm talking yeah. about. So you worked first. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yes, sir. And uh, then as, we, as time went along, within a year, I received my third stripe. Now tell us what stripes mean for those who are at home that didn't want to yeah. figure this out. <laughs> okay. Explain these bars to us. In, in, in the military, you have a, 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 a ranking system. The, the system starts with, uh, you begin with no, no stripes if you're enlisted, zero stripes. And you can receive up to, like in the Air Force, uh, eight stripes. Okay. And uh, from that, uh, you, know, you're, you become, from, from zero stripes to four stripes, you are a, uh, just a, an enlisted person. Then you become a non-commissioned officer, as they call it. Okay. And the non-commissioned officer or NCO, actually, these are the, I'd say, the people who normally run the military. They're like the, 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 the workforce. Okay. And uh, the higher rank you have, uh, uh, stripe-wise, the more you uh, position you have, you become a management or manager, uh, from a manager to a superintendent, from a superintendent to well, at the military, we used to say, almost God. Almost God. Oh, yes. wow. Wow. Almost God. And your money go up. Yes, your money goes All up. All right. Yeah. With, with each stripe. Yes, sir. And so uh, what we do, we always look forward to trying to gain rank. Yes, sir. Okay. You'll proceed up the, up, up the so rank. So it's 1962. Yes. You got two bars. Mm -hmm. You're going to receive a third bar. Yes. And what happened? Okay. From, the, from there, I was able to... More, more or less at this time, choose where I might want to go uh, to be stationed. At. Okay. Now, the good thing happened to me in 1963. A lot of things happened in 63. One of those is that uh, I met a person. what you say? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> happened well, to be in Georgia. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, have, I thank God then, and I thank God now. Amen. We have been married 61 years this awesome, year. Awesome, man. Awesome. And that's the way I, I like it. Yes, sir. It's a beautiful thing. It is. It yes. is. It's never been all roses, but it's a beautiful yes, thing. It's a beautiful thing. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, my wife uh, and I have been married for 61 years, and uh, we like to uh, continue that relationship. Yes, sir. And I told, I, I told God then, you gave her to me to take care of, and so I'm looking for you to take care of me and us. Yes, sir. And he has. He's been a blessing to yes, us. Sir. As I matriculated through electronic areas, uh, through uh, computer fields and communications, I did obtain more rank. Uh, I finally received the rank of Master Sergeant. Master Sergeant of Six Stripes. Okay. And uh, that's uh, in the superintendent area of uh, management. And uh, you become a supervisor of groups of people. Could be anywhere from uh, 50, as few as 50, to as many as a couple of hundred. In 1965? Yes. So we, we, this is beyond 63. Okay, okay. 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 Uh, I, because I, I became a tech, technical sergeant first okay. after my fifth stripe. And then I became a master sergeant after that. Okay. And that was in 19, I gotta think now, uh, that was in 1978. Okay. Okay. No, it wasn't either. It was 1975. Okay. And uh, I then became, I was requested to become a part of what is called the Airborne Command Post because of the record that I, that, that I had and also the report that I had with, uh, with other people, uh, higher ranking people, officers, and things like that. Uh, I then went into the Airborne Command Post field as a, as a supervisor, <clears throat> communications supervisor, and uh, that's how I became attached to the Airborne Command Post and found out about Air Force One 
and things like that. In other words, an upper echelon of communication. Gotcha. Okay. And uh, the president has the capability of speaking to anyone, anywhere, anytime he wishes, by any means he wishes. All around the world. All around the world. And uh, we had to make sure that, that he had that capability. In the 70s. Yes. Yes. And now things have gotten, uh, the same mechanisms are in place, but everything is much smaller yeah. because it's computerized. Gotcha. Okay. So you did 20 years. What did you, wh what was your ranking when you came out? Master Sergeant. Master Sergeant with the Six Stripes. Yes. So I noticed in our visit, just talking about the house, checking in on you and, and Mama Covington, I noticed you got a lot of pictures around on the wall. Yes. And you said, well, that's my son, that's my son, that's my grandson. So you have two generations of uh, military. Yes. All right. Okay. Yes. And you just had a grandson who just went in about, yes. a, about a month ago, two months about ago? The three months ago. About three months ago? Yes. So how did you feel about coming out, make your contribution, and hearing that your sons wanted to go into the service? Well, I thought it was pretty good. One, the only thing that they uh, had going uh, against me there was that they wanted, they did not want to put any parts of the Air Force. Oh. Because they were raised in the Air Force. <laughs> <laughs> so we done so, with that. Right. Okay. So, so two of them, the, the, the oldest one and the second oldest one went into the Army. Okay. Okay. And the third one went into the Navy. Okay. Okay. So I had three sons. And all, all three went to the service? Yes. They all okay. Service. And how many of their children have went to the service? Oh, uh, jeez. Two, two of them, well, the, the second oldest one, he has a son that's still in the, he's in the Army. Okay. And uh, he's been in the Army now for about six or eight years. Um, the, I had another one that went into the U.S. Marines, a, grand, a grandson okay. that went into the U.S. Marines. And uh, he's, he was in, like, about f six years, five or six years. Okay, so did your sons become career uh, military as well? Or they just uh, no, they decided to do their time in in. in Get out. Okay. So um, with you going in and being a trailblazer mm -hmm. uh, in that area, communication, computers, and so on, do you feel that there was a proper uh, recognition for African-Americans' contribution to work in, the, in that area? I do know. And uh, at, when I first went in, I thought it was, a, it was a lot of restrictions in place. Restrictions meaning um, racial Restrictions, right? Uh, because they would say, "Well, you, you, you know, y'all don't know how." I heard that often, yes, sir. And I said, "If we don't know how, how come I am doing, and I am somebody?" <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I always put that on them. Yeah, uh, I have this capability. I have others that I work with also, and uh, that have the capability. That's right. And, so, and a lot of them more than more so than I. They're better than I. Yeah. Um, I said one thing I wanted to do was receive as much training as I could in every aspect of electronics. Um, I became uh, technically inclined to, to a point of, uh, I built, back in the day, I should say, uh, we had a large screen TV. It was a 50-inch television, and I built it. I may actually put it together. And what year was this? Uh, this was in uh, 1968. Wow. The largest TV that we had at, that you could get at that time. I built it wow. and put it in a, a, in a case. I built, built a frame for it. Okay? And uh, I had it for a long time. I, in fact, I still had it when I uh, retired from the Air Force in 1980 and moved here. And my youngest son wanted it, and he, yeah. I, he, I gave it to him because I bought a new one at that time. I said, no, there's no need to build anymore. That's right. I could buy it You're cheaper. Right. You're right. <laughs> Do you feel that the armed forces over the time you serve gave that uh, recognition to you or to other African-Americans? And do you see any progress now in racial equality and diversity? Yes, yes. Uh, because during the time I went in, I, well, from the time I went in, I saw many African Americans excel, especially in the officer ranks, yes, sir. the commission officers. Uh, I see. I saw more pilots and navigators, African American, 
Uh, I saw female that uh, get promotions uh, and also to receive commands. The, uh, I saw my, the first base commander was African-American and that was in 1968, no, 1967, 1967, the base commander and the, 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 what's called full bird colonel at that time, the base commander of the Air Force Base. And um, then I saw the, my first black general. Wow. And uh, I was able to meet him at the time, and that was in the 70s. And uh, then there were a number of others that since then. I know even today, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is an African-American Army military. The Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force is four-star general, African-American today. So it's, we have come a long way and uh, since 1960 and uh, they're very highly respected. So what would you say to young boys and girls come out of school now um, that may not know the direction they want to go in, may not have any ambition for school education or possibly need this opportunity for a springboard into getting education. Um, how would you present them as an opportunity and what they can expect to get from this type of you know, career? I think that the military has a lot uh, to offer African-Americans, young African-Americans. And uh, they, they, it's a place where you can receive an education. Not only education in basic things of life, uh, technical, non-technical, uh, mechanical. Uh, you can become engineers in the military. The military will train you for that. The military will give you an opportunity to uh, matriculate through college to receive bachelor's degrees yeah. and master's degrees. They will pay for it. Yeah. It, but you have to be a person that has the mindset that I can do whatever it is that I set out to do. But you had, and you have to have the fundamentals. Yeah. I was and thinking you have to hold that. your head up. And, and I think that's important, you know, um, and then that's why I asked you on the front end about what it meant to be in that environment at that time where we were being stripped from pride mm -hmm. publicly and what dignity that gave to you uh, to serve in that capacity. And um, for those who came back from the service, who came back home to be shamed after ser serving that country. Um, I think we need a sense of pride and we need some lessons taught to us and discipline uh, that in many cases we're not getting anymore. Our homes may not have the type of structure. People don't even have no goals or hope for, you know, things being better. And does the military give those qualities to them to see themselves different, see themselves successful, see themselves yes. making a contribution to the world? Yes. Um, I'm glad that you gave me this time to speak with you and to share your history. If you would like to leave a word on record to a young uh, Jerry, who's 18 again, coming fresh out of high school, and you could talk to the uh, seasoned deacon, Jerry, what would you tell him? I would have to say, young brother, hold your head up. When you're walking down the street, don't look down. Look out straight ahead. You don't know where you're going if you can't see where you're going. Also, don't let anyone tell you that you cannot. You don't have the capability. You have the capability. God gave you a tremendous amount of capability. And it's one of the things that uh, I have, uh, I thank my parents for, is that I was raised in the church. And I have always had faith, faith in God. I used to put a lot of faith in man, but I, that has kind of changed a little bit. Not, not a little bit, quite a bit. But both, all of my faith now is in God. Yes, sir. Thanks, Steve. I'll leave that.
Thank you so much. Um, I believe that your name rings loud in this congregation pertains to your contribution, your service over the years and how you carried yourself um, as one who hold their head up and look, look down the road. And uh, I pray that as others come along, that they will echo your name as well of one who's made a great contribution and been a model of how we should live out and serve. So I appreciate it. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. Thank you. This is.